I appreciate it. Let's try it again. Good morning. Now that's what I want to hear. Hey, it is great to see everybody. And uh, for the prayer time for today, I just want us to, re I want to remind us of how important right now really is. We get to sing to our God. We need, we get to let him know how amazing, how wonderful he is. So we are going to pray for our singing and our worship to him. So would you stand please? And let us start our worship talking directly to our God. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for who you are. I thank you that we get this opportunity to sing from our hearts, to sing from our minds, to let you know how amazing, how glorious, how you are in charge, how the battle belongs to you, how <clears throat> just how amazing you are, Lord. So God... Hear our prayer, hear our worship, and it's in your son's name we pray, amen.
So 
Y'all may be seated. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? He replied, Go into the city to a certain man and tell him, The teacher says, My appointed time is near. I am going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to say to him one after the other, Surely you don't mean me, Lord. Jesus replied, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely you don't mean me, Rabbi. Jesus answered, You have said so. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had I felt sung the tug at that time when he talked about Jonah running away and, and God showing him grace and delivering him from the belly of the fish. I can remember talks about Peter denying Jesus out of fear multiple times. And I didn't answer the call. Even more recently, we've discussed the Israelites wandering aimlessly. And for some reason, it was that illustration that finally made it sink in for me. I think I've been wandering for a while, running, denying what God's called me to do. And, you know, he calls us to do this for him. Uh, communion, coming together, meditating on on what it's all about. And, you know, as humans, that fear sometimes gets between us and what we're called to do. And even Jesus, you know, was human. And Jesus experienced the emotions that humans do. In our rooted groups uh, that we've been doing this past week, actually referenced that fear that Jesus felt in the garden. Three different times he, he called out to his father and and said this, my father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And he came back twice with a similar message. But ultimately, he overcame that fear and he answered the call. So my message to you today is, you know, Jesus is always reaching out, pulling you in a certain direction. Don't let that fear keep you from doing the work that God's trying to do in your life. Uh, I'm glad that I've finally answered that call, but you know, I, I just hate to think of all the missed opportunities from when he first called me until now that I, that I passed up. My favorite hymn from when I was a child, I went to Church of Christ and they sang a cappella, and I remember this song being so beautiful, uh, 10,000 Angels. You know, and, 
And the message of that song is that Jesus didn't have to die. He could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set us free. Um, but it ends with, he died alone for you and me. So uh, that's what we come to remember at this time and I ask that you bow with me. Father, I thank you for your son, Jesus. I thank you that he answered the call because if he had not, this would all be for naught. We'd have no hope of eternal life with you. We'd have no hope of, of writing, uh, being forgiven of our wrongs and cleansed. Um, Father, we thank you for that sacrifice um, and what it took to get there on that cross. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Appreciate that word, a testimony from Levi. That's a good word. And I appreciate the worship time this morning in the band. Thank you guys very much. What a great honor. Go ahead. That's all right. Clap if you want to clap. If you don't want to clap, you don't have to. What a great honor for us to gather together and worship. Huh? What, what, what an opportunity. Uh, Matthew chapter 5 is where we are in the Bible today. Matthew 5. Uh, Matthew is one of four little books that start the New Testament we call Gospels. They are life stories of Christ. That's what they are. And Matthew's story is the story of the King Jesus coming. Chapter 1 it has about the genealogy of the king, and it goes back to David and on back to the kings. Chapter 2, uh, the magi come. The wise guys from the east come, and they worship the king. Chapter 3, you got uh, the baptism of Christ. Chapter 4, the temptation. And in 417, it says this. From this time, Jesus began to go everywhere and preach the good news of the kingdom. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And so he comes as king, and chapter 5 starts this king's speech, which is an introduction to what he wants and what he expects out of us and lifts a, a high bar for us. Today we're going to talk a little bit about the bar of love that we're called to, which reminds me a little bit of my old Norwegian friends, Oli and Lena. Hey, it's, it's better than dad jokes, huh? <laughs> just, just kidding. Oli and Lena, <clears throat> I, I told you about Oli and Lena lying in bed one night, and Lena... Uh, saying, if, if I die first, will you marry? And yeah, I'll marry him, and, and probably would. And, and it ends up with the golf clubs, you're left-handed, and it was kind of bad. And uh, Lena said to Oli, Oli, I don't want you to marry that left-handed golfer. If I die first, I want you to marry my cousin Sarah. He said, Sarah, you've always hated her. She said, yeah, I still do. <laughs> now, come on, folks, that's funny. <laughs> that is funny. Yeah, I still do. That's why I want you. <clears throat> I don't want to explain it. Or something about that, uh, there's a little revenge factor, and we like revenge, don't we? We like payback. We like when the bad guy gets it. I, I, I don't know how many, how many of you love Hallmark movies, but I'm, I'm just telling you, they're, they're okay. They're okay. I've seen my share. They're okay, but, but they follow a set pattern. I come in the house, I go, hey, Julie, where are we in this movie? Just tell me. 
The first part is they, they meet, they're infatuated. He's from the city, she's from the country, whatever. And, you know, and, and this business, and but he's helpful, and, and, and they get along, and there's these spark, and you could just tell this is going to work. I don't know what, just get together. But then there's a, a conflict. Usually he's hugging another woman. It's his sister, okay? She didn't know it's his sister. She's all frothed up, and it's never going to work. And finally, they, they get back together, and they kiss, and the movie ends, and we're all happy. Welcome to Hallmark. Now, am I right? Absolutely. And did you still watch them? Sure. Why not? <clears throat> I, I myself prefer old westerns. Anybody else? Now, that's real, real movie making there. And the story, <clears throat> they're all the same. The story goes like this. Somebody, some scoundrel does something awful to an innocent person. And then here comes Mr. Good Guy. And Mr. Good Guy is going to right the wrong. And for the whole movie, he chases them down, and finally he blasts them away, and we all go, hey, now that's the way life should be. <laughs> Am I wrong? The movie Taken, Gladiator, the same. Okay, it's the same. It's innocent mm, revenge. <clears throat> now, I will say this in my, somebody said, Mark, you, you shouldn't watch those westerns. There's so much gunplay, it's just so violent. Can I just say this in defense of Clint Eastwood? He never shot anybody that didn't need to be shot. <laughs> and you can write that down in your sermon notes. And you're like, if they need to be shot, he took care of the business. Now, now, we like that. We like the idea of revenge, but that's not the way of King Jesus. In fact, he has a completely different way. And by the way, the way of revenge doesn't work. It just makes things worse and worse. He has a different idea, and we ask, well, will this work? And the answer is yes. What he says amplifies chapter 5, verse 20, which is the key verse in the whole sermon when he said, Unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. you got to go past what they did. And here is some surpassing righteousness. For six times in chapter 5, Jesus says, You've heard it said, quotes the Old Testament, and then says, But I say to you, we looked at, uh, I say to you, you heard it said, Don't commit a murder? Well, I'm telling you, anger is a problem. Don't commit adultery? Lust is a problem. Divorce, he goes on with that, vows. And now chapter 5, verse 38 and this is maybe the hardest part of the sermon, for some of us at least. It says this. You've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, did not resist him who is evil. And what follows are four illustrations of not resisting the evil. Whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn him the other also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. Whoever shall force you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks of you, and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Why? Well, in order that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. He causes his son to rise in the evil and the good, sends rain in the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax gatherers do the same? If you greet your brothers only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore, you're to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. So that's a pretty challenging section of Scripture. Anybody? And he starts with, you've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Let me just say this about that Old Testament teaching. That was legal code. It was for the community of Israel. The idea was if there's a crime, there should be a punishment that, that suits the crime. Okay, And it wasn't about individual responsibility. In fact, Leviticus 19.18 says, do not seek your, seek your own revenge or bear a grudge against a fellow Israelite. Love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So first of all, it wasn't individuals when he says an eye for an eye. It has to do with the community thing. And then it was to limit revenge and to make the, uh, the punishment appropriate. Here's what normally happens. If you, if you knock me down, I retaliate, I knock you out. Does that make sense? You, you knock my tooth out, I knock your eye out. That's the way it goes. Revenge usually builds up. And he's saying, now, don't do that. If it's an eye, we do an eye for an eye, a tooth for tooth. We take the appropriate legal responsibility. The teaching is more revolutionary than any other. And this, let me give you three cautions about this, this teaching. First of all, Jesus is not endorsing abuse or abusers. The purpose is not to, uh, to forbid revenge. It's to encourage lawlessness. It's not to encourage lawlessness and abuse. The Bible always encourages us to stand up for the rights of the weak, the poor, the downtrodden, the widows. James 1.27, this is pure 
Undefiled religion is not of God, our Father. Visit orphans and widows in their distress. Keep yourself unstained from the world. God cares about that. <clears throat> Jesus has harsh words for those who don't care for those who are downtrodden. And no doubt, I just have to say this, that in a crowd this size, I'm no doubt speaking to some who are victims of abuse. Some who were physically abused, some verbally abused, and some sexually abused. And I just want you to know that when Jesus says, we're doing away with this eye for an eye thing, he, he is not saying that what happened to you is okay, because it was not okay. And I'm, I'm afraid that sometimes people have gone with their abuse to people who should care, and they were quoted this kind of verse that says, don't, you know, don't take your revenge. He is not endorsing abuse. Got it? And I'm sorry if anything like that happened to you. He's also not forbidding uh, self-defense or defending others. And when he says slap your cheek on the right side, Trish, you're handy. Thank you very much. It, for me to slap Trish on the right cheek from here, I get that long, it would be the backhand. I, if I really wanted to do damage, I would hit you with the forehand. Does that make sense? And so what's happening here, slap him on, the, on this cheek, the right cheek, it's more of an insult than injury. Okay, so it's not time to hurt somebody. And it's, not, it's not wrong to keep from getting hurt. A couple of times in the book of Acts are examples of this. The Apostle Paul in Acts 22 was arrested. They were all stirred up. The Jews in Jerusalem were mad at him. and They, they arrest him. And the Romans were about to beat him. And he said, hey, before you beat me, I, just remember I'm a Roman citizen. Okay? And as a Roman citizen, I have rights. And if you do this, I mean, you, you can do it, but you're going to be in bigger trouble. Okay. just for your own protection. And so he uses the law. He does it again in chapter 23 where he goes and, and tells the commander, hey, these people are out here ready to get me, and he got a police escort and get him out of town. Self-defense and defending others is not wrong. And here's another idea. Uh, Jesus is not affirming weakness. And we think the way of Jesus sounds pretty weak, make for a lousy movie, kind of wimpy. You know, you do good to me, I, or you do bad to me, I do good to you in return. It takes strength to return good for evil. Now, here's a picture like magic. See that? <clears throat> I don't know if you know who this is. This is uh, from 1945. Uh, the guy on your, on your left, I got to look at, <laughs> is Jackie Robinson. The other guy is Branch Rickey, the general manager of the Brooklyn Dodgers. And you need, you need a little baseball history, don't you? No. Today's the last day of baseball season. I'll get you a little history for baseball. <clears throat> who said no? Jackie Robinson's the first guy to break the color barrier and play in the major leagues, first black man to play major league baseball. At the time, in 1945, the Negro Leagues were going well. You can go to the museum in Kansas City, marvelous display there, and you can learn a lot about race relations and baseball both. Branch Rickey was the executive, the general manager for the Dodgers. In 1918, before you were born, he was managing a college baseball team I think it was Ohio Wesleyan who he's managing. Both of these are strong Christian fellows, by the way. And he took his team on a road trip. They got to stay in a hotel. And the desk clerk said, they had a black player, I think it was Joe Thomas, said, he cannot stay here in the hotel. He cannot have a room here in the hotel. Well, Branch Rickey wasn't having it. And finally, he got the desk clerk to say, okay, he can stay in your room. And so he gave him the keys to his room, and he got all, all it paid for. When he went up to the room, his black baseball player was weeping, sobbing, and scraping it on his skin, saying, if I could just get rid of this black skin. And that lit a fire under Branch Rickey. He said, I, I'm going to do something about this. So in 1945, he called Jackie Robinson to his office in Brooklyn. At the time, Robinson was playing for the Kansas City Monarchs, and he had a conversation with him. He said, I need a special man, uh, not just great skill, but great character on and off the field. He said to this, if I put you on the field, you're going to suffer all kinds of abuse, unjust and constant abuse. You're going to be cursed. But if you, when they curse you, if you curse back, they will say, look at the Negro curse. If, when they swing at you, if you swing back, they'll say the Negro is a fighter. We win if the world's convinced of two things, that you, number one, are a fine gentleman, and number two, a great baseball player. Jack Robinson said, are you wanting a ball player who doesn't have the guts to fight back? Ricky said, no, I want a ball player who has the guts not to fight back. He put, pulled down from his shelf The Life of Christ by Giovanni Papini, and he read the words that we've read today. If anybody smites you on the right cheek, turn to him, the other also. And <laughs> Jackie Robinson said, I've got two cheeks. And he was a fine gentleman and a great baseball player. 
But don't, don't mistake this. He was not a man of weakness. He was a very strong man. Uh, he, he served in the military, played football at USC. He was a strong man, but he laid down some of his rights. That's what we're called to do. In fact, Jesus said, you want to know what weak is? Weak is when you love people that love you. That's weak. That's not enough. Listen to what he said, verse 46. You love those who love you, what reward do you have? Don't even the tax gatherers do the same? Verse 47, you greet your only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Don't even the Gentiles do the same? He said that the tax collectors do that. The mafia, they do that. The, the drug dealers, they love those who love them. The Cub fans, just check and see if you're still awake. Any, anybody, he said, we're called to a much higher standard than that. It takes strength to do that kind of love. So <clears throat> when he says, turn the other cheek, he's not talking about enabling abuse or re- not defending yourself or being weak. What does he mean? Well, number one, kingdom love goes farther than normal. It causes us to go a lot farther. And Jesus got really practical when he said, whoever forced you to go one mile, you go with him too. In that culture, the Romans were occupying an army there, and the rule was, the law was, a Roman officer, a Roman soldier, would walk up to you and say, here, carry my pack. And you had to carry his soldier's pack for a mile. So the good Jews knew where a mile was. They staked it out all around the house. There was a mile down the road. When they got to the mile, they turned around, put the pack down, turned around, and walked home, and weren't very happy about it. And Jesus said, go the extra mile. He had their attention. And I think they, had, they thought to be thinking, you've you got to be kidding me. Go an extra mile? That's what we're called to do. Go farther in love. Two really good preachers at the end of the 18th, end of the 19th century in London, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, still got some of his books, and Joseph Parker, two big preachers in London. And Spurgeon preached at the Metropolitan Tabernacle, the Prince of Preachers. You may have heard of him, probably not, but he was a good preacher and had an orphanage in his part of his ministry. One Sunday, Joseph Parker was talking about Spurgeon and about his, and he said, said about the orphans that came. He said a lot of the orphans that go to to Spurgeon, are in very bad shape. They're, they're really in terrible shape when they get there. Well, Spurgeon got the word that Parker said that the, the, the orphanage itself was in very bad shape, and Spurgeon was ticked. The next Sunday morning, the crowd gathered, and Spurgeon let loose on Joseph Parker and just let him have it for his careless speech. Now, in those days, not like today, sermons were published in the paper. It was big news particularly Spurgeon. His sermons are all in a newspaper. And so Spurgeon let it, let it fly and just went after him. The next Sunday, the great crowd showed up at Parker's place to see what will Parker say in return. And Joseph Parker got up that morning and said, well, I understand that Brother Spurgeon is out of town this week. And this is the, t- the week they normally take an offering for their orphanage. And I like what we just did that here. Why don't we have a love offering today? And they said they had to pass the place three times. They had a great offering. And the next week, Spurgeon came and knocked on Parker's door and said, Parker, you did me in. <laughs> okay. You showed me grace that I didn't show you. Now, that's what it means to love and go farther in love. See, followers of Jesus care more about repairing relationships than they do about airing their grievances. Anybody can air a grievance. And Jesus said it's better to swallow an insult than return it. Now, you have a choice when you're insulted. You can escalate or you can deflate it. Proverbs 15.1, a gentle answer turns away wrath. A harsh word stirs up, stirs up anger. And love says you're more important than my property. Therefore, if you want to sue me, sue me and take my shirt, you can have my coat also. It's more important than my schedule. I hadn't planned to do it, but if you need me, I'll be there. What you do, when you do what is normal, the situation controls you. Jesus asked us to respond and control the situation. So imagine the soldier comes and said, I want you to carry my pack. You can imagine a Jewish man going, I'm... Oh murmuring, oh, you, you, have you, you know, oh, just got, and he has to do it, and he, he picks the pack up, and he walks his mile with him. He's mad the whole time, and he gets to the stake. He just drops it, and he turns and goes back home. He's so, his whole day is ruined. His wife comes in. He snaps at his wife. He kicks the dog, and things are bad. And then he hears this Jewish rabbi, this new teacher, say, when somebody asks you to go one mile, you go an extra mile. And so he gets, the guy says, carry my pack. He carries his pack. And for the first mile, he's still not very happy about it. But he gets that mile mark. He knows now I'm on my own. I'm choosing to do this now. And as they walk along, he begins to talk to the soldier. Where, where are you from? Oh, you're not from around here. 
<laughs> where are you from? And he tells him where he's from. And how about, tell us, talk about your family. And they, they talk all the way. And finally, he gets to the end. He said, you know what? You get back in town. You look me up. Maybe we'll have dinner together. Because now he's in charge of the situation rather than just revenge. Love takes you farther. This kind of kingdom love goes wider than normal as well. It includes a much bigger circle. You see, they, verse 43, you've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That is not what the Old Testament said. The Old Testament never said hate your enemy. It said love your neighbor as yourself. So they restricted what kind of love it was. They restricted who be loved when they said you could hate your enemy. Who is my neighbor? When Jesus was approached by a lawyer, he said, what, what, I need to, what do I need to do to go to heaven? Jesus said, we've got to love God. You've got to love your neighbor as yourself. And the, and the lawyer said, well, then who is my neighbor? That's still the big question that people ask. See, it's pretty easy to have a list of people you want to have blessed. Also, to have a, easy to have a list of people that you would not like to see blessed. In fact, that you'd like to see cursed. <laughs> Did you say that? There are, the Bible is an interesting book. You ought to read it sometime. Really, I, I'm, I'm kidding. It, I'm, I'm not kidding. There's a bunch of psalms, about 13 of them, called imprecatory psalms. And we don't talk about these much, but these are times when David says, that guy there, God, if you want to, you want to pour out judgment, that'd be a good guy to get. Let me just read this to you. Psalm 69, and just as an example, verse 22 says, Let the bountiful table set before them become a snare, and their property become a trap. Let their eyes go blind so they cannot see. That's a lovely prayer. Make their bodies shake continually. Put your fury on them. Consume them with your burning anger. Let their homes become desolate and their tents be deserted. The one you punished, they add insult to injury. They add pain to those that you have hurt. Pile their sins high. Don't let them go free. Erase their names in the book of life and don't let them be counted among the righteous. Now, what in the world are we going to do with that? I mean, I, and I've read commentators who say, well, you know, that was because they were the enemies of God. Therefore, God, you know, well, maybe. But you know what the real problem was? They ticked David off. And David said, God, I just, I'm just sick of these people, and I'd like for you to squash them like a bug. There's another place where he says, rub their faces in the ground and break their teeth out on the rocks while you're doing it. Okay? It doesn't make you it kind of warm your heart a little bit. And Jesus said, that's not the way it's going to be in this kingdom. See, we're going to love differently than that. Normal love is selective. It discriminates. Kingdom love doesn't. We love people as an investment a lot of times. I love you because I know you're going to love me back. And I'm nice to you because I expect you to be nice to me. And, and nine times out of ten you are. And the tenth time it, things aren't bad. But we work at it again and we, we have that love thing going back and forth. But Jesus said God sends his, verse 45, his son to rise in the evil and the good. Sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. And we're to love everybody. Verse 44, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Not like David, but pray a blessing on them. If I only pray for people that I like, I'm not much like the God I pray to. He sends his rain on everybody. Peter Miller was a preacher in the 17th century. He was a, make that the 1700s. He was a friend of George Washington's. He had a guy in town, Michael Whitman, who just hated him. And everything that the preacher would try to do, that Peter Miller would do, that Whitman would just oppose him and Everywhere it went, it was just trouble. Finally, Whitman was accused and accused of treason and found guilty and sentenced to be hung. The preacher, Peter Miller, walked 70 miles to see George Washington. He said, General Washington, this man in my town has been convicted of treason. I would really like for you to pardon him. That's the opposite of David's prayer. I'd like for you to pardon him. And Washington said, you and I are friends, but just because we're friends doesn't mean I can pardon Michael Whitman. And Peter Miller said, friends? We're not friends. He's the worst guy in town. He's my most bitter enemy. And Washington said, in that case, I will pardon him. And they walked home together 70 miles, and they walked home as friends. Today, Christianity is becoming increasingly unpopular. What we believe is offensive to our culture you can expect resistance and opposition. No, that's just true. I mean, what we believe, what, what we teach here, this, this teaching today is revolutionary, but a lot of what we teach is so revolutionary. When you say that there's one way to go to heaven and his name is Jesus, and apart from that, you don't have any chance. You can expect opposition from the culture. When you can say that God has designed marriage in a certain way, that it's one man, one woman for one lifetime, and that's it. 
Now you can, hello, you can expect, and it, sex in those bounds is the only place it's supposed to be. You can expect resistance in our culture. I believe things that, that people look at me and go, you're out of your mind. Okay, I, I got that. What do you do when people are hostile to you? And if you live for Jesus, you speak the word, you, you're going to find some hostility. What do you do? You'll be judged by the way you treat those who are hostile to you. That's what they'll remember more than the fact of what you believe or don't believe. The way King Jesus is not for wimps. You've got to be strong to love like that. And kingdom love is stronger than normal. Two ways. Number one, it's strong because it comes from God. One thing the King's speech drives home is this. We need more power to love people. You can't love like this on your own. In Romans 5.5, 5, we know how dearly God loves us because he's given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. To love like Jesus, you have to know his love for you and then give it to other people. And that, that kind of love has a powerful impact. It put Jesus on the cross and has, alone has the power to change the world. So we love further, wider, and stronger. And you've got a choice to make. Next time you're insulted, next time you're overlooked, you take revenge, will you have kingdom love? One strategy shells movie tickets, the other changes the world. Romans chapter 12, the Apostle Paul said it this way, Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what's right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. It's written, vengeance is mine, I'll repay, says the Lord. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you'll heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That's extreme teaching. And Jesus showed the way when he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. You need a new heart. Ezekiel 36. I'll give you a new heart, put a new spirit in you. I'll take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. That's tough stuff from Jesus. You've heard it said, but I've got a higher way and a better way to love. Now, we're just going to close in prayer. Just let me ask you this. Would you bow your head, please? Let me ask you this. Anybody's name come to your mind while we're talking today? Anybody that maybe is an enemy or maybe somebody you just have a hard time liking? Would you pray for God to bless them? And then pray that God would give you the power to love them in spite of the fact that they're hard to like. Father, we believe that Jesus is the king. We want to live like he lived and love like he loved. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, thanks for joining us this morning. I have a few announcements for you. For our young members and families, don't forget about our engaging youth programming every Wednesday from 5.30 to 7 here at the church. And it's open for pre-K all the way up through high school, so we can't wait to see you there. High schoolers, be sure to join us at the Petty John's residence tonight, that's 105 North Drive, for a Bible study slash swim party from 5 to 7. Now you might be asking, why are we swimming in October? And the answer is, it's a heated pool for your enjoyment, so we hope to see you there tonight. Ladies, we have a wonderful opportunity for you as well. First off, we have the Women's Bible Study, which meets every Thursday here at the church at 9 a.m. A great opportunity to fellowship and to gain a better understanding of the Bible. But not only that, we have the Ladies Book Club as well that is next meeting on October 30th, and they are discussing the book Significant by Rachel Reiner. We don't want you to miss out. That's all the announcements I have for you this Sunday. I hope you have a great afternoon, and we'll see you next week.